the early 1900s, the bustling city of New Orleans, Louisiana was terrorized by a serial killer. They attacked 12 people in their homes over the course of a year. What makes this case unusual is the alleged killer's promise to spare those that played jazz music from their homes. While the reign of terror ended in 1919, the after effects are felt even in the present. Today, we look at the disturbing case of the Axemen of New Orleans. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force. It's another Monday, so we got another mystery for you here on Red Web, the show all about the unsolved and the unknown. Conspiracies, cryptids, true crime, all that good stuff. I am your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, and joining me, hearing the mystery for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. 12 murders over the course of a year? Mm -hmm. It's like once a month. That is once a month. I could not imagine murdering someone once a month for the next year. That's just never. Never would my mind go there. Would I think of it? Would I act on it? But once a year, you're still you're in. You're subscribed to that idea. Well, well I mean, once a year. I'm trying it? to catch this man, Christian. Look, he's flirting with danger. I think we got him in the crime. Okay, so it's manageable, but you you wouldn't. I've seen it. Dexter. You chop people up in little pieces, then oh you, you take a boat out to the ocean, <laughs> yeah. then you just dump all the bags. Okay. I, that's the one scene out of Dexter I've seen. And, it, and it, you're right. That's what happens. Um, To play jazz music. Jazz music. Yeah. What a unique request. Very. Well, I mean, it is New Orleans. It, I mean, it is. But if it, there's it, any place to request it or yeah. someone that's murdering to request such an odd thing, yeah. it would be New Orleans. Yeah. But I just like, could I throw on jazz music like on a radio? Maybe. You know what I mean, does that count? We'll, we'll get into all of it. Because if I have to actually play an instrument, look, what, what kind of oh. quality song, uh, like, right. of, of playing are we I talking you about here? I playing jazz. You're like, well, you're going to get some tone deaf scratches on right. the cello. Or can I just do Oh, some mouth trumpet? Yeah. That right? actually sounded really good. Like a nice muted trumpet, some Louis Armstrong right there. There we go. Oh. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, to what degree, you know? Yeah. Like, if if he, if he busts into my door and go, it's me, the jazz killer. <laughs> it's, it's me, like, the X Men. You're like, oh my god! Right. <laughs> he goes, dang it! <laughs> ah, just, that's right. That okay. <laughs> your hands are up. You're, you're quivering you just, a little bit. And then you just hear like next door, it's me. <laughs> it's just, like dudes going door to door. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's murder, it's gruesome. That's right. why we make light of things because it's, sure. it's so dark. But we I, need to bring some levity to these dark topics, right. you but know. And there's going to be a lot of darkness in this one. What a weird counter to a killer. Yeah, we'll dive into it. It comes in a very mysterious letter. With oh man, it gives me the heebie-jeebies thinking about it. But we're going to recount the letter that comes, and we're going to break down things a little differently today. I'm going to give you okay. at the top. Some briefing notes. Okay. We're going to really break oh. it down like a case file here right. for you. Then we're going to go into the timeline of each of the acts, each of the attacks that happened. Okay. Followed up, as always, with the theories as to who was behind this or what was behind this. Oh, all right. Yeah. So you're breaking it down. Let's break it down. Let's dive in. High-level information to brief you on the case. The killer would become to be known as the Axemen of New Orleans. They terrorized the Louisiana city and the surrounding areas. The killer was active from May 1918 to March of 1919, so just shy of a year. The Axemen had killed at least six victims and injuring six others. As the name suggests, they murdered their victims using an axe, usually the victim's own axe. Most of the victims were actually Italian immigrants or Italian Americans, and this led some to believe that the attacks may have been racially motivated, which would fit the timeline we're talking about. And with regards to the Axemen, Detective Joseph D'Antonio, who we're going to talk a little bit more about later, told news outlets this, quote, There seemed to be something almost supernatural about his ability to get in and out of places, and even be seen without a single victim remembering any details. So there you have it. Some mysterious info to set the tone. Well, we are talking about times where you could lockpick things. Mm -hmm. There isn't like motion detectors or anything like that. No cameras, no fingerprints, no DNA. Right. I mean, stealth mode would just be taking your shoes off, right? 
What? I was sipping my water. <laughs> I was trying to gulp from my sippy cup, and you, you hit me with that one. I'm just saying. Ste stealth mode is <laughs> taking your shoes <laughs> off. That's brilliant. That's I'm. I'm just saying. We're shoe free on this podcast, by the way. I'm just. I'm just. Crocs saying, and socks or nothing walks. <laughs> That's what I say. Sorry. Hit or me with nothing it. walks. I don't like. I don't, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Here, here's the thing. If we were able to time travel, boom, back to that time mm -hmm. period right now, we all had those old timely shoes or whatever, right. boots or what have you. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you right now, we'd be able to do that test in seconds, right? We I, would I, humble I, I, this man's ego instantly. I would. <laughs> you, walk, I can't wait to get to the letter. Arms wide open, walk across the floor. He's like, <laughs> he wow. is strutting. Wow, certain amount of DB you got going on. <laughs> take, hitting him take with the, the decibels. shoes off. Walk backwards, right? And Why like, are you walking like a dolphin wow. on the tail? Why is it so much quieter? That's, that's all I'm saying. I mean, that's why they call tennis shoes sneakers. The rubber sole is oh, really? like more silent than the hard, normal, like, yeah, there cobbled you, there shoes. There you go. Nowadays, you can wear sneakers. But yeah. back then, take the shoes off. Right. And Squeaky floorboard's going to trade on you, but yeah. also, I feel that. Uh, yep. Seems like it's racially motivated. Um, there is a, an MO as far as the, the, the uh, victims are right, concerned. Victims. Yeah. That being said, too, another weird like rule. What if I don't own an axe? That's what I'm thinking. And we'll dive into it more and more because I don't want to delay too much longer. But you're right. Yeah. A lot of the times it seemed to be that the perpetrator would get into the house, use the victim's own axe, and then leave it and then flee. I'm like, maybe you just got to get rid of the axe. Because then what do they do? We'll get into that. I mean, oddly enough, mm -hmm. serial killers love their MO. It's they love their doing their thing. As the as a task force member once said on our subreddit, mm -hmm. we talked about the servant girl annihilator that oh, happened here in yeah. Austin. We talked title. about the theory of them being maybe Jack the Ripper. They succinctly put it as the a self-labeled ripperologist that serial killers like their MO is like their fingerprint. Yes. And I love that take they, because it kind of is. Yeah, it really is. And they, they rarely like to deviate from it. And there is a very strong fingerprint. Like you mentioned, it also has to do with the victims. And, and we'll tie into that because it comes around in the theories as okay. to maybe why that's the case. Who is behind all of these mm. things? I, all I'm saying is that like, it sounds silly, but oddly enough, this serial killer could go into the house, not see an axe, and feel conflicted. True. Like, Which is ah, my moves. What a odd situation. My backup hatchet. To be, right. Maybe. I don't know. All right. Let me take you back in time. May 23rd, 1918. This attack happened around 4.45 a.m. Jake Maggio was woken up in his home by a loud noise in the next room. This is another common occurrence that you'll see in each of these attacks. He got the assistance of his brother, Andrew, and found their other brother, Joseph, and his wife, Catherine Maggio, were killed in their own home. Their throats were slit with a razor blade and their heads were subsequently hit with what they determined to be an ax. Now, you may have keyed in on the initial detail there of the razor blade. This is the one and only time that a victim known to be killed by the axemen was killed with a razor blade, but you know the ax is still in play here. The couple were of Italian descent and owned a grocery store. This is another very specific MO we'll continue to identify. This bloodied razor was found in the lawn of a nearby property while the axe itself was found in the bathroom. Police had ruled out robbery as a motive because the valuables that had been hidden in plain sight, sitting on the counter, sitting on dressers, etc., appeared to be untouched. So, clearly whatever this attack was, was strictly for these two individuals. When investigating the property further, police found that the bottom right panel of the kitchen door had been removed. Police also reportedly found bloody clothes that the killer left behind. Some sources claim that a strange sentence was found written in chalk near the Maggio's home. And it says this, quote, Mrs. Maggio is going to sit up tonight, just like Mrs. Tony. Let's put a pin in that quote in that strange chalk written sentence, because we're, we're going to go into more detail regarding this potential Mrs. Tony when we get to the theory. So remember that name. We're going to pin it. Okay. It, man... It's interesting just knowing like different times, right? Mm -hmm. This was today. Boom. You're caught. We Done. got you. Done. Easy. Oh, Done. Yeah. Got your DNA all over the place. You got your handwriting, everything. The hair follicles, the fecal matter, whatever it is. Yeah. You, you could literally leave evidence behind, yeah. right? Leave like that, they dropped the axe and just, just like there it is the in the bathroom. You wouldn't. 
you, man, people nowadays- Their bloody clothes? They, they would incinerate it, yep. take the ashes, Sprinkle it across five different lakes, like they're change their name and right. move it, countries, right? It, exactly. Yeah. Here, it's just do it and leave it. Yeah. Okay. So coming back to Andrew Maggio, one of the brothers again, he actually became the lead suspect in the case as he was a barber, and it's believed that it was his razor blade that was used to kill the couple before the axe was brought into play. One of the Maggio's barbershop employees, Esteban Torres actually told police that Maggio had taken his razor from the shop two days earlier in order to have a nick honed from the blade, which is just some odd timing on his part. However, Andrew claimed to have seen a strange man lurking about their residence. This explanation and the fact that Andrew would not break into his own house is what convinced police to dismiss him as a suspect. Okay, I was also about to say, like, do you have access to a barber? You know what I mean? Some Sweeney Todd action. Chop my chop my hair at home. Why do you gotta why do I gotta go to the shop? Chop it at home. It's convenient. It's yeah. easy. Bring your stuff. You can do me up. It's true. It's weird though that he's like, I'm a suspect. I saw a, a mysterious man. They're like, oh, you're good then. I mean, well, like, what else could they go off of back then? That's right? true. Like, that you know, that's true. Also, the fact that it is his own home and part of the kitchen door panel had yeah. been pulled back, like, yeah, I don't know. That's what I'm I mean, you could totally block it beyond the outside and try pulling it open and, and set it up that way true it, it's just but for like what reason yeah well let's dive into the next case because you're okay. going to be almost astounded despite the huh. fact that we talked about this how identical a lot of these attacks are from top to bottom so let's get into it so a little over a month later at 7 a.m on june 27th 1918 a baker named john zonka arrived at the home of Louis Besume to deliver some bread. Instead, he found Besume and his mistress, Anna Lowe, both unconscious in the apartment behind the store. For the record, Anna sometimes went by the name of Harriet Lowe. They were both struck in the head by a hard object which police believed to be Besume's own bloodied axe, which was found in the bathroom of the apartment. Both Besume and Lowe survived the attacks but suffered from extensive injuries. Eyes then turned to Besume when letters written in German, Russian, and Yiddish were found in a trunk in his home. Now, it's unknown, unfortunately, what these letters contained. I'm not sure if that's lost to time or if the letters are lost or if it was just not documented very well. But it's suspected that Besume was a German spy and the government launched an investigation into espionage. Besume was arrested after Lowe confirmed that he was a spy but he was released two days later, and the lead investigators on the espionage case were then demoted due to their poor police work. Besume was then arrested again in August of 1918 when Lowe claimed that he was the one who had previously attacked her. And so he then went to prison for nine months, charged with murder, before then being acquitted and then released from prison. And then unfortunately, seven weeks after the attack, Lowe passed away due to her injuries. So wait, they caught a spy, but then released him? So basically you have Louis and Anna. They're found to be, have been attacked and unconscious. Mm -hmm. When they came to, mysterious letters that are neither here nor there because we don't have the contents seem to indicate that Louis Besume might have had some weird alter life. Like he might have been a spy. And Anna Lowe was actually fingering him as some sort of German spy. So he was arrested. And there's no grounds for it, so he's released. And then Anna Got later it. is like, no, 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 he attacked me. So he goes back to prison, this time for nine months. And then she passes away. It just seems very unfortunate for him. It seems mm -hmm. like he had nothing to do with such things, and he's just getting thrown around all over the place. Well, he was also attacked himself. Right. So unless he, like, hurt himself and I mean, that's faked an extra unconscious. But... layer. I don't know. Like, for me... I feel like, you know, being the mindset of like, I'm going to hurt someone, even to the point where I'm going to kill them. That's just so many layers in a mindset mm -hmm. and a thought process. And then even then to be like, okay, I'm going to essentially hurt myself to the point where it appears that I'm also hurt. That's just, that's a lot of layers to get through. Yeah. And people have done it. Not saying it's, it's sure. not possible, but it, yeah, you really got to like, that's a lot of like mental walls to break down. I'm going to be a killer. I'm going to stage that I'm getting attacked. I'm going to hurt myself severely. It's a yeah. lot to premeditate. Yeah. Unless you're in the moment, you're scrounging, you're going, oh God, what do I do? 
Uh, someone's at the door. Hey, yeah. True. Yeah. I mean, so a, a couple things here. Obviously, using an axe once again. The axe being left in the bathroom. This particular one didn't have any evidence of a door panel being peeled back, but we will see that that comes back to the forefront. But it's spooky at this point how similar these attacks are going to be. And it's worth mentioning, and I'll probably reiterate it, that at this point in time, there's no word for serial killer. There's no idea oh, of serial yeah, killer. Right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're that early on. Jack the Ripper was maybe two or three decades prior to this across the pond over in mm -hmm. uh, the London area. So it's still a novel concept in that sense. So at this point, and all, kind of through this entire series, the police are treating each of these cases individually. And so that's where you're going to see some wrinkles because we're coming at this like knowing or at least with hindsight thinking that this is all one person. Right. But you got to remember that. That's, I, I forget that that's just so fascinating, right? Right. There's always a first for something. Right. And, and that's those so are recent. one of those things you just don't think of, of like, you're right. At some point, someone, someone, had, to someone be. had to be a serial killer, right? Someone had to go, I'm going to do this. And then I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm gonna do that the same way. Right. And yeah, in the same way. Like wow. I have a specific like calling card signature in which I implement these murders. Mm -hmm. I right. I mean, that must be so mind bending during that time to be like, wait, I think this might be the same person. I think there's one person out there doing this over and over and over again when yeah. it's just not a thing that's common. And then the first investigator to step up and be like, these are all so similar. What if it's the same person? Right. Imagine the odd, the possible odd pushbacks you'd get of like, guys, hear me out. You know, yeah. bring, being in the don't be ridiculous, precinct. Steve. Right. Yeah. Who does that? Don't but be also, ridiculous. The, Nowadays you'd be like, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, that's possible. Yeah, hundred percent possible. But imagine that dawning on you, just yeah. like the mm -hmm. the dark nature of that uh -huh. settling into your mind, and you're just going, oh my god, what right. if what if this is all one right. sadistic person? So. Bleh common of a thought yeah that back then is just you'd have to convince people that yeah. this is possibly the same person yeah it totally changes how you investigate these and that's what yeah. we're gonna see is like a lot of the times they they look for the most immediate solve which is why a lot of the people that are either victims themselves or mm -hmm. just nearby become persons of suspect right right or, or persons of interest because that's just kind of how it went but moving on let's talk about another unfortunate victim. We have Anna Schneider. On August 5th, 1918, shortly after midnight, Anna Schneider's husband found her badly injured after he came home from work. She was hit with a hard object that the investigators later suspected was her bedside lamp and nothing at home was stolen. Schneider said that she woke up to see a dark figure standing above her bed. Thankfully, Anna survived and actually gave birth to a healthy baby girl two days after her attack. Police then arrested ex-convict James Gleason shortly after this attack, but then released him because they couldn't find any sufficient evidence for this person having been involved. After the attack, investors started to suspect that the crimes could have been related due to the similarity of the attacks, but also the demographics of the victims. However, again, this is a very novel idea at the time, the one of a serial killer. So not an axe this time, a lamp. This time was a lamp. What? I can't imagine being, oh man, this extreme scenarios. Yeah. Giving birth to a child two days later. Oh my goodness. And, and also, this is so strange. And I think I flag it in the next one because this is, I flag it because eventually I go, why is two all over the place? Two days after ha this happens, two days after that happens. There's a lot of twos in this. So I want to say that now so you'll start to see it with me. I'm like Jim Carrey in the number 23. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like in the last one, you had Besume who was arrested for two days, then released. This time you have a child. In the next one, you will we'll get there right now, actually. Let's dive oh, in. Oh, okay. We have Joseph Romano, who was with his two nieces, Pauline and Mary Bruno. When he was attacked on August 10th, 1918, Pauline and Mary woke up when they heard loud noises from their uncle's room. Again, at night, in the dark, people wake up. When they hear a commotion, they go to figure out what's going on. The sisters claimed that they saw the axeman fleeing from the scene and described him as, quote, dark-skinned, heavy-set man who was wearing a dark suit and slouched hat. Like the previous attacks, an axe was used, nothing was stolen, and a panel on the back door had been chiseled away. Romano passed away in the hospital two days after the attack due to his injuries. At this point, the public 
was also becoming aware of these attacks from the Axemen, and on August 22, 1918, the New Orleans States reported this, quote, Armed men are keeping watch over their sleeping families while the police are seeking to solve the mysteries of the axe attacks. Five victims have fallen under the dreadful blows of this weapon within the last few months. Extra police are being put to work daily. That summer, two other Italian grocers reported coming home to panels on their back doors being broken, and many citizens reported claims of seeing the axe men. And then we have a long break after this, so let's kind of digest. A lot of Italian grocers are being attacked, they're chiseling away at the back door because they figured out this is a good way to get in. Happening all around the city of New Orleans in the suburbs. And I have a map that I'll show you here in a second. But what what is your gut telling you at this point? Well, now you're getting the public involved. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're getting a lot of reports of, I've seen the axe yep. murderer. Yep. Um, Things start to get cloudy at that point. Right. My back door is broken into. I'm sure most are real. If, but I mean, I'm also sure a handful are just like, oh yeah, I saw the axe murderer. Like, come my story it definitely seems like it's racially motivated mm -hmm. like i'm going after italians mm -hmm. um the the axe seems like a majority of the time i use the axe right. thing uh we still haven't gone to the jazz stuff yet we haven't gone to the jazz stuff that happens in, soon which is interesting because i thought it would play an earlier part in this yeah because i know this vaguely i know of mm -hmm. this case but yeah, it comes surprisingly late in the timeline of these events. A lot of incidents went down. It starts to get public as you identified. And due to that publicity, due to it starting to get into the newspapers, then the person steps up to, honestly, it's very creepy the way they wrote their letter, but almost boast about the situation. And, and we've seen that with other yeah. serial killers in the past. Well, we did talk about one side of a serial killing spree's perspective, right? The authorities. Mm -hmm. But now it's just kind of making me think, oh yeah, the serial killer themselves would also have to figure themselves out. So I think that's kind of where we're at, where they're they're doing these murders. They have already solidified in their mind, in their head, I'm going to kill multiple people. But you can tell, or at least it feels like, they're still trying to figure themselves out as yeah. a serial killer. Mm-hmm. Axe is what I primarily like to use. Sometimes I use what's convenient to me. Sometimes I'll leave a note or a letter or something like that if I can. Uh, or like, you know, you yeah, have the chalk. Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting one. I, I feel like they're figuring themselves out. And that's, yeah. kind of the, that's kind of the story that's being told right now. Yeah. Honestly, that's a really interesting take. I, I, I think that's really fascinating to think of it that way. I think for like nowadays, Dang. it's such a common thing and you can look back at other examples yeah that that train of thought that process is is kind of uh just really push at a quicker pace mm -hmm. but back then right these people don't know there's not a serial killer right thing. they, they had to no figure one it out else it takes weeks months look whatever. At and you go oh okay i kind of like doing this yeah i kind of this you know is, what i'm gonna drop off the chalk gimmick yeah it's too stressful. It keeps me at the scene. Too yeah. many clues. You're right. Because when we look them. at movies like Zodiac, Jake yeah. Gyllenhaal's Zodiac, I mean, it's a really fascinating way to take a look on the inside of the, the mind, but also of the police as they investigate. But you're right. Uh, looking back, it all feels like, boom, people have an MO right out the gate. But yeah. They actually, yeah, in a, a very creepy sort of experimental way, they sort of figure themselves out. Mm-hmm. But this is when there's a huge gap in the case that I think is very important to put a note in. We're going to come back to it once again in the theories. But there is eight months that go by with no further incidents, at least no incidents that can be clearly attributed to the same person. But that's when we jump forward to the next year, March 10th, 1919. Residents heard screams coming from inside the house of Italian immigrants Charles, Rosie, and Mary Cortmelia in Gretna, Louisiana, a New Orleans suburb across the Mississippi River. Neighbor Iorlando Giordano rushed across the street to investigate and found that all three family members had been attacked by an intruder. Both Charles and Rosie thankfully survived the attack, but unfortunately their baby Mary did not. Oh my God. Okay, so anyone's fair mm -hmm. game. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which does draw into question how and why the other attacks happened for example, just the most recent one, there was two kids in the other room right, that the, heard- Their uncle. Yes, they got up and they checked and he's been attacked. 
There was another one where the two brothers and whatnot came in and then the brother and wife were attacked. So it's interesting here that the whole household was attacked and the neighbors had to come by to figure out what was going on. I mean, again, could be a, them, they're figuring themselves out. Yeah, or, or maybe the, if people see things, then they get involved by accident or something. True. But, or they're just getting, unfortunately, used to the act uh, of murdering. Mm -hmm. And so... After eight months, too, something's been soaking in that mind, mm -hmm. that sick mind. And oddly enough, I assume that in some cases they're chasing a high. Perhaps, yeah. Right? If you keep doing the thing that gives you that high, you, you get you used to it. You gotta push it further it, and further. You push it further. Mm -hmm. I don't know, just spitballing. No, I mean, it makes sense. It's just terribly dark. Right? Oh, yeah. So, of course, much like the other circumstances here, nothing was stolen from the house. However, they did find that the back door had a panel that had been chiseled away, and once again, an axe was found bloodied on the back porch of the home. Rosie made claims that Giordano had attacked them with his son Frank, while her husband, Charles, repeatedly denied these claims. The Giordanos actually owned a rival grocery store and reportedly had quarreled with the Cordemilias in the past. So now there's some form of motive here, but now you Ooh, have right. the husband and wife disagreeing on who did the attack. The two were actually arrested and charged with murder. They were found guilty. Frank was sentenced to hang and what? his father was sentenced to life in prison. Wait, were they wrongfully accused? Well, a year after the attack, Rosie admitted to falsely accusing the father-son duo, and they were then released from prison shortly thereafter. Neither of them faced the death penalty they, one of them was subscribed to have. But a year after the event, Rosie's like, listen, I, I falsified that claim. It wasn't them. What? They're released. Yeah. It just seems like it's so easy to be like, that person did it. Right. All right. That's, arrest that's them. not the first time someone came to help, and then they got themselves roped into it as right. a prime suspect. It's unfortunate. I mean, it, Oh man, it just seems like it's so easily to just accuse someone and then have them pay the price. Oh yeah. That being said, with all of our advancements today and our updated systems and whatnot, people are still being freed to this very day for yep. things that they did not do. Yep. Or being accused when there's no hard evidence. It's it's wild. There, the, the, it will always move as technology gets more advanced to figure things out. Of course, more situations, more crimes or whatever get solved. But there's always that fuzzy gray line where someone is a always. are they aren't they sort of situation. It's really unfortunate. It is very interesting to see where like big leaps in investigative technology will backdate the release of wrongful accusations, mm -hmm. right? Like DNA testing has freed a lot of people. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like there's no DNA evidence at the scene. Yeah. We took all this like evidence and none of it pops up. So many people that had been arrested in the 80s and 90s especially because they're still alive, they're still kicking, and they're in prison for life in the early knots uh, through like the teens of the 2000s here. A lot of those people have documentaries about them. I honestly think that there's something to the uh, true crime wave because of that. The advent of DNA technology, taking cases back to trial mm -hmm. to surface new evidence because of that, and then freeing people. Like that's been a, a huge wave in our right. kind of generation for sure. So again, they were released from prison a year after. And now around this time, the Times Picayune published a map of the attacks calling the Axemen the Panel Burglar. It's a bit of a misnomer. They definitely went for the panels, but they didn't burgle anything. Right. I mean, every time we there's been some type of incident we talked about, or, and they, they took nothing. Right. Now, I gave you a map of New Orleans at the time. You can see kind of one, two, three, four, five all the way up of the attacks and whatnot. You can see some of them are clustered, but otherwise they're a widespread. One thing that you won't be able to see from that map is the fact that a lot of the houses that were broken into had similar layouts, almost like the person was familiar with a certain type of home, how to break into a certain type of door. And so again, it's a very, very thorough MO. I mean, you're doing something with a lot of variables and a lot of unknowns. Walking into, I mean, we've all d walked into someone else's house, right? Mm -hmm. We've Where's gone the over bathroom? as a friend. Where's the bathroom? Where's this? What does that lead to? You don't right. know. Imagine, like, with the intent to do if you want to get into crimes, now. right? If you want to do crimes, and, and I mean, first off, just rewind back just a little bit. Are these little squares 
houses? All those little squares so are probably plots of land. Okay. But yes. Otherwise, so houses. So many plots of land. Yeah. And then I see here, yeah, they just kind of chisel a little panel off the back door and slide right in. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't look like a big gap. But, I mean, even to this day, there's a lot of suburbs where they just copy paste. Right. Here's your like three floor plans, which do you like? Four different layouts. Yeah. You, you visit one, you know all of them. This takes me right back to the Winchester house. And yes, that was more spiritually related and yeah. trying to avoid the ghosts, but... Now you can understand in the mind of someone who feels tormented right, why over they decades. Expand they're like, and have make this house super custom. Right. And doors that lead to mm -hmm. nowhere. Yep. Yeah. Now, now you can kind of get it. But task force, as always, I'm, I, I like to say it to make sure you're reminded. But the visual of this map and everything else, I actually want to post the letter itself as well. Will be available on our social platforms, Twitter, Instagram, but also on our YouTube channel. So everything that's visual, we'll make sure you got it. But yeah, very interesting that it's not really tucked into any one neighborhood necessarily. No. Now, with that said, it is time, finally, to discuss the letter. On March 13th, 1919, three days after the attack on the Cortimelia family, the Times-Picayune newspaper received a chilling letter from someone claiming to be the Axemen. It read as follows. Hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I'm what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axemen. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with the blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. Jumping forward in the letter, I'm going to skip a few paragraphs here. He says, quote, now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time on next Tuesday night, March 19th, 1919, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of you people who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Signed, The Axeman. Look, I'll be honest, that's just a man. That's just a man right there. It's just a man. Talking with all their fancy, right. polished up language they're like there's some sort of faux Shakespeare. Right, at this point... We have Ham Hamlet's scribe out here trying to sound like... At the end, too, they started getting extra Hamlet-y or extra Shakespearean right. with the hoomst and shalls. This just is us. This is a, a murderer, a killer, a person that at this point is just having fun. Yeah. Uh, twisted fun. Yeah. But fun nonetheless. Mm hmm. And now they're, I mean, they're obviously mixing their personality into it. I'm quite sure they're into jazz. Yes. And they just went, you know what would entertain me? Yeah. To see how many people I can get to play the type of music I like. Yep. Dance for me, city. Right. Dance. 100%. Yep. Let me see if. Because I've already got this city in a state of panic. Yeah. Might as well twist them. It's the confidence. The way I want to. Have a little fun with it. Yeah. Very confident. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, riding as if they're this demon, this spiritual entity. And Full of themselves. And Egos inflated. They've had a couple of you know, you, clean runs. You have, you know, it was mm. the times and also the location where, you know, Supernatural, New Orleans, that type of thing. Right. Uh, bigger on superstition, where a lot of people and still cultures is. still is. Yeah. Uh, but that just to me, I don't know. This person's really like grasping at things that they know and love and really just making a spectacle of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it, it becomes clear that after almost a year now at this point of attacks that, whether successful or otherwise, they got away with, mm -hmm. their ego is just overflowing yeah I, i've done this multiple times i i'm in the newspaper well, right i'm i'm famous and uh they just feel like they can't be stopped absolutely well as you can expect the letter sparked enormous amounts of fear throughout the community and most everyone on that night played jazz from their homes many bands were said to be playing all over town many other new orleans citizens went out dancing kind of making a whole thing of it again to be with other people would be safe but also, regardless, 
if you believe this or not, if you think this was actually the guy or not, you kind of want to just, I'm going to play some jazz to be safe. So there was actually a lot of bands in houses or people would oh, kind of wow. pool up into different places. So I don't know if the mouth trumpet's going to get by. You mm. know what I mean? It's a good defense. It's a good idea. Right. You might give him pause. You might right. go, hmm, this one makes it a Multiple little bit Multiple people in sour. a house. <gasps> Different instruments with their mouths. Okay, now you're talking. That's a band. Right. Right. At what point do you define a band? Multiple people, mm -hmm. instruments. Mouth. Exactly. Mouth is an instrument. Mouth organ. Or don't play any music. Turn off all the lights. Wait. Uh, set up the back door. Uh, your rocking chair at the back door. Yep. With a shotgun. With a shotgun. That's what I'm you thinking. See this, you see this mother stripping out a little hole. Yeah, dude. Surprise. Right. You home alone him. Right. When he opens the doggy door, bang. Uh, that's look. That's what I'm saying. You surprise yeah, him, right? That's so dangerous. Actually, now that I think about it, so dangerous. Yeah. For the for the killer. Yes. Because you're like this night, this time. Yeah. Imagine the amount of people that have weapons that want at this point avenge people, mm -hmm. uh, want to be, you know, vigilantes, all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if there were people looking for this person. Absolutely, there were. So before the letter even came out, it was a kind of a subtle detail I slipped in there, but. Mm -hmm. The reporters in the newspaper were saying that armed men were walking around the city looking for this person. So they weren't vigilantes in, in the traditional sense, but they are out there looking for yeah. an axeman. And so it turns out no one was killed that night. And to me, Surprise. I think yeah, exactly. And uh, to me, it says it's a taunt. Right. That's it. Playing uh, with your food, essentially. Oh, a hundred percent. And whether it was like, I'm going to taunt them. Nothing will come of this. Mm -hmm. Or he went. Uh, There's a little too much heat tonight, and then just backed off. Yeah, no killings. Yeah, that or I mean, the possibility of this person themselves being a jazz musician. They're just like, this is a great opportunity to kick up my original gig and get out of this killing game. So Not I'm very lucrative. Made me make a lot of money. Right. Tour. Guys, I got our band booked at a house nearby. <laughs> right. Crazy night, crazy times. I'm booked. I mean, that's at the very least. Yeah. They like jazz. They like jazz. But you're in New Orleans. That's so not really going to hone it down. No, no, no. Not at all. The not heartbeat to, of jazz. No. But let me ask you this. So are you sitting in a quiet home trying to pull this guy in? Or are you blasting some post-hardcore metal just out the window? Some punk, you know? And you're just like, this will draw him in. Was there punk back then? No, definitely not. Oh, okay. You invented it for this night. Oh, that'd be yeah. wild. No, I'm sitting in a rocking chair with a gun. Oh, okay. I'm sitting next door with the, with the nice couple, mm -hmm. and they got a couple jazz records going on. I'm like, I'm feeling perfect, safe because then I'm just knitting. Be perfect because then the duality of the two yeah. will definitely make them go. This house thinks that they can get away mm -hmm. with not playing jazz music, right? And once and you, you pop the guy, and then, I'll have knitted you some nice socks to keep your feet warm. Well, the thing is, you're gonna be like in in the house going. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> what, what just happened? Dang. Oh my god, what's happening? And they, they dropped the beat hard in their late 19 teens. <laughs> That's what I mean. You'd hear it next door, Christian. It's okay, true. just That's make sure I'm it's saying. on beat. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I I think this is the most okay. So clearly, this is a heinous act, and uh, but this is a real showman. I mean, this is this letter alone is seriously in this in this mo this. This very, it's it's got a lot of religious context to it, right? Like the Egyptian stories of like, oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah mark, paint your, your, mark your door doors with the, and right, and we'll pass over your house so you don't, you know, whatever, whatever. I'm totally different story, but it gives a lot of religious undertones to this story. Yeah, but also like this is what really captured the attention of generations. It's why we're still talking about it is because it, mean, it's so disturbed, but also so like what. Jazz? Uh, okay. And it actually stayed with the city. I'm not saying that this is why New Orleans is centered around jazz, but it, it has stayed with the city in the sense that some resources that we've researched have pointed to the idea that there are traditions now built around the March 13th to 15th time zone, which is kind of the area that he was identifying to kind of honor this moment. Not honor this moment, but remember this moment, I remember should say. Remember the people that passed away. Yeah. Jazz is a part of New Orleans culture. Yes. No other reason to so, you know, make light of the day. And right. So a lot of jazz festivals, a lot of jazz music right. played in particular around this time each year. Yeah. Kind of as like some sort of uh, in remembrance. There we go. It must be so such an odd request to have happen. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I guess nowadays it'd be like what? 
play Taylor Swift and you won't be harmed. Oh gosh. Like you right? Yeah. Like, what's the equivalent? Make sure to bump the weekend on the weekend. <laughs> right. I want to hear weekend on Tuesday. Right. <laughs> oh God, heinous. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear that uh I always what was it? Rebecca Black's Friday, but I want to hear it on Wednesday. <laughs> I, I, oh god. <laughs> I mean, I always like trying to think what would the equivalent be today, today yeah. or what would the equivalent be Probably, back then. Ah, uh, it depends on the city, but I would say right now what's really in is is pop and and hip hop, right? Is that like that's like mainstream? At least we're past like I don't know, what is it? The, boy bands uh, and oh boy bands. I can, and, I can, and, I can and like late that. 90s that's pop. Already, that's already playing in my house, but I mean oh, like that's fair. probably like uh Techno stuff, tra oh, trap music, yeah, well. Skrillex that type of stuff. Was wham, that? Wham. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> like imagine having to play that at twelve thirty. You're not gonna get any sleep, right? Well, maybe that's maybe that's the gimmick. True. But coming back to 1919, many people believe that the Axemen wanted jazz to be played from their homes to protect them, and like that maybe the Axemen was a jazz player that they love jazz, what have you. But many others still joked about the letter and believed that this was all simply a hoax. Historian Miriam Davis actually theorized that John Joseph Davila, a composer and a musician, is the one who coined the letter. After the alleged Axeman's letter hit newsstands, Davila published sheet music titled, quote, The Mysterious Axeman's Jazz, Don't Scare Me Papa, and made a lot of money on it, like huge profits. And so that's why they said, well, maybe this was somebody capitalizing on the idea for their career. Sick in its own way, but... Possible. Oh, look, very much possible. Mm -hmm. Also, dubstep. That's the genre I hate. Um, it is dubstep. Right? The motive is there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I made a song literally about this right. serial killer. Can we hear that, Christian? We obviously, because it's like, well, from 1919, it, it should be. Is there like, it, it depends on the copyright thing? Yeah, it right. depends on whether the copyright lapsed or renewed or anything yes. like that. Yes. Yes. Maybe Disney has it, so we'll never get it. But I'm very curious what that song sounds like. And while you look into that, because we don't know if we can even play that or not, we just want to react to it. Task Force, you can look it up if you'd like. I want to go into a couple more of the attacks mm -hmm. before we end the timeline and move into the theories. So these ones, not a lot of detail, but very, very similar to what we've talked about. So I'll kind of move through them. We have Steve Boca, who was another grocer, who was attacked in his sleep on August 10th, 1919. This was about five months after the attack on the Corte Emilias. And then on September 3rd, 1919, we have Sarah Lauman, who was found injured in her home. Both had been attacked with an axe at night, and neither could remember anything about what went down. No details, basically. So they weren't murdered. They were Not attacked. murdered, attacked, unconscious, survived. It's a 50-50 split on... The victims that passed away. And There's the a that lot of people. I mean, look, being attacked, period, mm -hmm. is devastating. But there's a surprising amount of people that are attacked and left to live. Yeah. Because there has been previous attacks where he's gone for the for the head. Literally, yeah. Or or like the slit throat mm -hmm. and then the hit. So I'm I'm kind of blown away. Are, is he using the blunt side of the axe like a like a hammer or like a bludgeoning tool? Right. Because but also, as I as if I mean, thankfully these people yes, are able to walk away. But is there a reason why some are being killed and some aren't? You yeah. know, there were previous situations like with the uncle where the nieces walked in mm -hmm. and saw him jump out the window or what what have you. They thought they saw yeah the the escape dark the house clothes. essentially. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that there's other people in the house. They're, moving quickly, right. one hit, hope but it worked. There's a whole bunch of scenarios now where people are just by themselves. Yeah, for sure. It is like and being attacked in their sleep. Yeah. It's it's definitely a very good question. And I'll be honest, it doesn't really come up as an idea in the theories. Yeah. So we I, can definitely dance around with that. But you're right. I mean, when I think of an axe and I think of one swing to a person's that's anything, that's asleep. devastating. Yeah. It's a very compelling question, honestly. And then the last attack was October 27th, 1919. Esther Pepitoni found her husband dead after hearing a loud noise coming from his room. There, she saw a large axe-wielding man fleeing the scene, but was unable to recall any details about him later on when being asked by police. She did remember, however, that there were two men, two men at the scene of the crime. No other victims reported seeing two intruders. Mike Pepitoni's murder is the last known murder of the alleged axeman. 
copycat? Ooh, it's possible. Two people. Two? That's coming out of nowhere last minute. Right. It's it's a lot, and it definitely comes up here in the theories. Any last uh, last minute gut checks before we dive in? You mentioned a copycat. I love that. There's multiple people. Multiple people. It's definitely a theory we're going to talk about. Huh. But the people that have seen them, it's always been a large person. It's true. Holding, and it's always like an very few details. The only yeah. details we have are from the kids that saw him jump out the window. But again, very vague details. Always to fleeing the scene. Mm hmm. How unfortunate in terms of timing. Yeah. I mean, granted, it's not necessarily fortunate to see it happen in the process, but you might get a glimpse of their face or more detail because you're staring right at them. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe, I, I don't know. That just, it just seems so random. Last minute, two people. I'm not quite sure I believe this. Who am I to say, but right. I'm not quite sure I believe this witness necessarily. Well, in the moment of trauma, right. memories can be manipulated, mm -hmm. forgotten, shifted without your own desire. Like you could just misremember very easily right. in those moments. And so it's very hard to decipher what may have happened that night, which is, I mean, obviously why we have an unsolved mystery here. But after the death of Mike Pepitone, the Axeman murders suddenly ceased. I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that there were two people. I wonder if it has anything to do with the anything else going on, people seeing them, what have you. But it's, at the, t it didn't seem like there was any reason at all to stop. Right. The cops weren't close, closing in on them. Mm -hmm. uh, neither was civilians. Yep. Yeah, it seems like there's no reason they could have just kept going. Could have kept going. And again, to reiterate, investigators didn't know much about serial killers or that idea, and so they treated a lot of these cases individually. Hey everybody, it's Christian, just jumping in to take care of some orders of business, then we'll get right back into the episode. I want to thank everybody who showed up last week for a live shopping event celebrating the Sippy Cup of Knowledge. We were absolutely blown away by the level of support that you all showed us. Thank you so much for tuning in, getting a pre-order in. We hope you enjoy the facts from Trevor and the facts from Alfredo. We sold out of all the cups in just 37 minutes. That was wildly above all expectations we had. It was truly, truly incredible. Thank you. We are so grateful for just the level of love and support that you all show. You always show up. You always show out. Thank you so much. It truly means a lot. And hopefully we can do more things like this in the future. But without further ado, let's hear from our sponsor this week. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Getting to know ourselves is a lifelong process, especially since we're always growing and changing. And for a lot of folks, going to therapy can help deepen awareness and understanding of themselves. Because sometimes it's hard to know what we want or why we react a certain way. But it can really help to talk through our thoughts and emotions during those moments to learn more about what's going on. BetterHelp can connect you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that self-discovery journey. BetterHelp is entirely online and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a questionnaire and then BetterHelp uses that to match you with a licensed therapist. And if that person isn't the right match for you, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. It's all part of the process. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash RedWeb. Without further ado, let us dive right back into this week's mystery. Please enjoy. Now, there is one suspect for this entire case. Since police tried to solve most of the victim's deaths separately, this suspect was found after the murder spree had come to an end. So this is very much with hindsight that we discovered through our research, this suspect. Okay, we didn't discover it. I should say we, the collect, the royal we of the world. Oh, okay. Police officers discovered this suspect. But yeah, we have that person... It's the prime theory, so we're going to build up to that. It's got the most meat on the bone. Okay. But we're going to talk about three of the more general theories on the way there. So the first one, it's a very simple one, comes from criminologist Damon and Colin Wilson. They theorize that the Axeman was a sadist, someone who was targeting the wives of these men and only killed the men when they got in the way of protecting the wives. It doesn't really stand fully to reason. There's like a lot of wrinkles with this because... What do you say with the attack of Steve Boca, for example? There was no woman present at the scene there. As right. far as the Pepitones, Mike was attacked and the wife came into the room. 
and saw him leaving. That doesn't hold up. It doesn't really hold up. No, not not, not when like you really start to look. You're, you're, some seem directly targeted towards the males. True. Like you're, Absolutely. Uh, just, the uncle. That right. was another one. Yeah. So yeah, we we I at least wanted to talk about it, but it's interesting. New Orleans detective, who I mentioned at the very top, John D'Antonio, believed that this could have been the work of a, as he says, jackal and hide type. I'll let him speak for himself. Quote, a criminal of this type may be a respectable, law-abiding citizen when his normal self. Compelled by an impulse to kill, he must obey his urge. Like Jack the Ripper, suddenly the impulse to kill comes upon him and he must obey it. So maybe this moves on from the idea of it being a sadist kind of move to more of a compulsion, an obsession that you have to scratch the itch. And so that's where you lack some of the premeditation. You come in, you don't finish the deed, perhaps, and then you have to flee the scene because you're like, okay. ah. I see how that ties together. Scrambling for it. But why stop, though? But why stop? Maybe, again, with the idea of it being a law-abiding citizen with a compulsion, maybe they took reign of that, captured that, Overcame moved. their darker side. Right. But we'll explore some of that a little bit. The timelines of this person in the suspect theory. Yeah, I feel like Jack going high was just a popular tale back then, mm-hmm. and so it kind of made sense to pull a theory from what you know. Yeah. Then again, you have people like Ted Bundy, who mm. kind of, if you will, were able to use their charisma to charm people, to draw them in, and then would shift, right? And True. Then, so, like, the idea of Jacqueline Hyde is, is a very popular tale, but it's mm-hmm. also based on the ability for some people to just have that very psychopathic ability to shift. Just oh, yeah. snap into a different idea or a different idea of a person. But I think the idea of this being a compulsion is is interesting. It, but it does, does. But it doesn't answer who. It doesn't answer who, but it, why. it, it or does why. tie into why, aside from, like, this is early day serial killers... It does tie into why the murders for a serial killer was more scattered than what you would traditionally see today. Mm. You know? Yeah. Sometimes it was a little messier, if you will. Sometimes there wasn't a kill. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's an axe. You know, there was chalk written one time and not the other time. Like, in a sick way, too, it's almost like you look at again to reference these other serial killers like Zodiac, you almost go, did they study? these early types of serial killers and so like you have a messy serial killer like this trying to figure out their mo and then you have a studied one of the 70s i don't know i'm just making one up that goes ah i need my thing and well, it needs to be just so oh 100 percent. i think you have both i think yeah you know if someone was to become a serial killer today why would they not look back at previous serial it's killers? such a weird thing to think about it is it's almost like idolize in a way too you know what i mean yeah how'd they get caught how long did they get away with it for you know these are things you would want to know yep all right let's move on to the next one because it's something that you brought up the idea of multiple killers but this one goes into a place and this is where we're going to talk about mrs tony so dig that back up out of your minds but this one goes into a different direction that i thought was really interesting let's get in there some believe that this wasn't one specific axeman but rather multiple Within that, you also have folks who believe that perhaps there was one Axeman, but that there was a copycat killer which could have given the appearance of multiple killers. So there's two ideas, right? Two people or multiple people that are actually perpetrating these crimes Mm -hmm. or kind of overlapping with that. There's just a, a single copycat out there giving that illusion. Now, when taking a look at the crimes, some of them were more similar than others. And in the case of the Pepitones, Esther saw two distinct men. Furthermore, there were a handful of other murders that occurred back in 1911 that some consider to also be the early work of the Axemen. But let's flash back to 1911 and give you a brief rundown. Okay. This was seven years before the events of the attack on the Machios. The New Orleans states reported that a similar crime spree went unsolved. The deaths of a man named Cruti, the Rosettis, and Mrs. Tony Schiambra. It is possible that this is the same Mrs. Tony that was in the chalk graffiti nearby the Machio's home. Oh. So now to wind back the tapes, if this is the same person, these attacks happened in 1911. And then in 1918, right before or right after the Machio's attack, you have a chalk sign that says 
Mrs. Maggio will sit up just like Mrs. Tony or something to that effect. And like to connect yeah, the them. chalk one was the first in this yes, series. Of in murders. this room. Yes. Oh. So that again, it doesn't that give could you all, who or whatever, it but it's so interesting. It doesn't, but it does explain the chalk. It does explain a past series of similar murders. Mm -hmm. And it could also explain why the kills suddenly stop. Yeah. That could be part of their routine. I go on a spree for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe you get out of your system and then you take a break. Take come a break. Back. Pennywise style. Yeah. You go to sleep for 23 years or whatever. Yep. Now, there are two interesting things that are said to be a part of this theory before I offer you the wrinkle. Two things. All of them were Italian grocers, the new, these new individuals from 1911, and all of them were primarily attacked with an axe. So now it feels very cohesive that these were, they must be unified, or at least the attacks that we just covered are actually that of the copycat rather than that of the original axeman. So now the copycat idea is like plastic. It could have been that the last attack was a copycat duo, that all of these attacks were the copycat, or that there were just multiple people over multiple years. But interestingly, according to author Michael Newton, official coroner records do not show anyone with these names. And that's what really frustrates me because I'm like, how did this come to pass? Who made all this up mm. if we can't find coroner reports of these names? And why? That's a big wrinkle. I know. There's no. no real reason why the reports would be covered up or anything like that. There's uh, there's no apparent ties to mobsters or anything illegal happening with the authorities or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm leaning to believe that there wasn't a death there to yeah. report. Oh, man. It's it was, like there's it was, no reports, but where the reports maybe burned or thrown out or uh, was anybody else right. in on this back like, then where things were very much like tangible yes. as opposed to digital very physical but I mean that's where you then end up with a lot of people with different schools of thought was this the same person over a long period of time were there copycats uh, was there something in between we don't know and you mentioned mobsters because your gut check has now beyond the measure of normal instinct and is now predictive cognition you can read minds here we go the next theory oh. is that of mafia involvement. I mean, they were hitting Italian families. Could be. Absolutely. See, I'm and, telling and you, they're this all hitting the grocery, They're all hitting grocery stores and everything like that, too. I've always wondered, ever since I saw Ant-Man Quantumania, what it would feel like to have my brain read. And you're doing it right now, and I don't feel anything. That'd be a terrible power to have. Especially if your forehead glowed every time. <laughs> oh, God. I knew every time. It pinged every time I read your mind. It's like, don't do that. So I'd have to wear <laughs> Alfredo a just read your mind. headband. Oh, you get a text every time. <laughs> I have to wear a headband every time. We got, hey, listen, I, I, we're working on a uh, proprietary hat with a tinfoil lining. <laughs> we are. It will be able to we shield are. your brain. That's not a joke. <laughs> That's not a joke. No, we, we moved it into action. The wildest thing. <laughs> And I went, kind of genius. <laughs> yeah, so Task Force, if you're looking for a cap, we're we're working on it. It's coming. It's <laughs> Tin foil line hat. It's mm -hmm. a little secret just for you. It's just on the inside, so you can't tell. <laughs> also, we'll shield you. Yeah. Anyway, I jest, but truly, I, I really admire your, your gut instincts because, like, when you ask the questions, it's usually leading right to where we're headed. So let's talk about the idea of mafia involvement. You're totally right with all the victims being Italian grocers, investigators were thinking, well, or I should say Italian and Sicilian grocers, the media started to capitalize on this idea and were starting to run wild with rumors and theories that perhaps the murderers had something to do with a mafia element, just ambiguously. And so pulling on those threads, people have kind of extrapolated the idea that specifically a mafia organization known as the Black Hand may have been involved. The Black Hand was actually known for extorting businesses within the Italian community itself, and it was theorized that those victims that we talked about earlier didn't want to pay the mafia their extortion debts, therefore became victims of the Black Hand. Ah, and you set it up as like a serial killer. Yeah. Or like one particular person. Mm-hmm. Oh, that does tie nicely into why it was grocery store owners, why it was a specific race, mm -hmm. um, 
why there was two people seen towards the end last second. Yeah, and then one had two people. I mean, oddly enough, could tie to the jazz request too. Mm -hmm. Them just playing with the cops and go, look, right. let's make the cops in the city dance oh, for us. Oh, man. And if you uh, table the idea that a composer wrote the letter, how wild is I it? I do love that theory. I do like the theory. It stands a little bit. Now, imagine an organization is going, wow, they're calling us the Axemen. The Axe Man, rather. One man. Let's write a letter saying, yep, we are the supposed Axe Man to confirm like it is an individual rather than an organization. Then you can have a fall guy, wipe your hands clean, and move right. on. One guy oh. gets pinned for it, you're good. Yeah, and then you get jazz out of it. So local news outlets at the time claimed that the victims, in addition to all of this kind of theorization, claimed that the victims actually received threatening letters prior to the attacks. This feels like they're making their theory more grounded because the contents of these supposed letters, if they ever actually exist, mm -hmm. is not known. There's no letter that maintains itself to this day. There's no documentation of these letters. So it's a it's a really up in the air. Did they make this fact up to substantiate the theory to make people feel, okay, we know the bad guy now. We can calm down. It's right. They're not out there still. <sighs> I don't know. But there was no sufficient evidence to back all of this up. It's a fantastic theory. I think it stands in its own way. But again, when you start to analyze it, you start to go, well, I don't know if you're making things up to substantiate it. So it's a very flimsy theory at the end of the day. Right. That's just always a blur that you'll never yes. know. Yes. Yes. Now, to cap this off, I do want to say D'Antonio claimed that at the time, if this crime were the mafia or the Black Hand, they would not have left any victims. And I think that is an important oh, wrinkle to note. That's true. Yeah. Like, this isn't a, you know, hey, we're going to punish you in this moment, like, da-da-da-da. They don't want to leave anybody, no, no witnesses. This is a punishment for not paying them, so the theory says. They want to finish the deed. They don't want to be caught. It's not their MO. It's maybe not the Mafia or the Black Hand's MO, right? So... Was that their MO? I don't know. I don't... I'm, I'm not a Mafia because then, expert, son. Here's the thing, though. Flip side. But I would trust the reporter at that. But the whole reason why you're doing this mm -hmm. is so you can extort them for money. So you're saying injure them so right. that you get that money? That explains why you injure them. Don't finish them off. But then what if they just go... Screw it. I'm going to tell on you. It was that guy. Well, other than, I mean, it's, it's more so just teaching him a lesson. Then you come by and you go, oh, you know, yeah, dangerous times out there. My only experience with the mafia is relegated to film. Same. So I really don't, I really have no idea. I'm, that's where I'm going off of D'Antonio. for money. Yeah. 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 Right. It's a way to scare them, rough them up pretty that's, badly that's with, true. without throwing yourself in the pool of suspects. And you want them to be alive in order to keep or try to keep collecting money. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Task Force, let, let us know what yeah. you think. That's It gets hairy in there. But, you know, I've learned over these last couple weeks, many weeks now, Task Force is always sending in photos of where they're listening to this at. And I realize how many experts on different fields we have. We got a lot. Yeah. And like I said at the top of the episode, there was a Ripperologist, a self-proclaimed, like, somebody who really studied yeah. uh, Jack the Ripper. Somebody has got to be out there who knows the M.O. of uh, early 1900s, you know, the 19 teens, 1920s, mm -hmm. mafia, perhaps in the southern region. I would be very curious, Task Force. Hit us up. Because they, they're so good. Task Force is so good at filling the gaps. I mean, if we were ever to go on tour as like, you know, Red Web, invite mm -hmm. the Task Force to come out and show up. Do you know how much protein powder we'd have to have in that oh venue? God. So many buff scientists. We've got buff brains, buff minds. Buff brains, buff minds. We would just have mm -hmm. to, we'd have to fuel them all up. Right. We'd have to travel like Dwayne Johnson with a full <laughs> gym. You know what I mean? All the cocktails are like 20 grams of protein minimum. <laughs> So many weights clanging and banging. <laughs> I'll take the creatine mule, That'd be please. the weirdest audience to do a podcast for. <laughs> Essentially, a gym. We might, as well, we might as well not like rent out a venue. Just go to a gym with a couple mics <laughs> and Web, some chairs. Red Web hits up the local 24-7 fitness. <laughs> you know, the red carpet rolls out. We walk in. Everyone's slanging and banging. And we're like, listen, it's time. Anyway, that leads us to the single suspect of this case with some juicy details within it. So let's, without further ado, dive into it. We have Joseph Monfrey, also known sometimes as Mumfrey. 
In Los Angeles in December 1920, a woman dressed in all black was arrested for the shooting of Joseph Monfrey on a street corner. This woman actually turned out to be Esther Pepitone, the widow of Mike Pepitone. She told police, quote, he was the ax man. I saw him running from my husband's room. However, Pepitone's wife was previously unable to describe his appearance to the police. So this did raise some questions at the time. It's very questionable. Mm -hmm. Especially since you'll maybe recall that she saw two individuals. Also, why not go to the authorities? She took justice into her own hands. Listen, it was a crime of passion. You took her husband, in theory, she's going to take you. But also, remember, she saw two people that night. So what does that mean? I don't know. Questions yeah, one galore. Of them, apparently. I guess so. Maybe that's why there's Monfrey and Mumfrey. Maybe two Josephs oh, in the similar. night. Oh, similar. Yeah, J and J. Now, despite these questions, we'll, we'll kind of table those for now. Monfrey was reportedly a known criminal in New Orleans and was in prison. Oh man, I love this detail, Fredo. Let me blow those little red web socks off. He was in prison from August 1918 until March 1919. Now for those buff brains out there, the astute listeners, you might have noticed something. That is exactly the time period at which the axe murder spree was on hold. Remember those eight months that the axe murders stopped? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, continued with the Cordemelias? Right. I'm glad you broke it down for the listeners that weren't right, as right. astute. For, for the listeners, right? right? Yeah. Take a sip of your, from else. your sippy cup. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> he drinks so happily. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But seriously, that's that's just... Uh, ew, it lines up nicely. Everything? It lines up nicely. Why would that? Mm. Especially, listen, Task Force, let's take you back to the whoa, sepia whoa. tone times, okay? Fingerprints out the window, DNA out the window. I was going to say semen all over the wall. <laughs> <out the window. laughs> I mean, you throw semen at a crime scene Leave today. It in. You throw semen at <laughs> a crime scene today, you get caught. You're done. You're done. The internet, that's not there. So, what else do you go on except for big coincidences and also prior records? Hmm? I mean, you mm -hmm. go heavily on prior records, what you do. Right. Or you just trust whoever saw something and said something, and then you just They're stick them in the brig. You know, it's a lot of that. Yeah. And um, a lot of like, oh, actually, they didn't do it. Um, whew. When did she kill him? She killed him in December of 1920. So this would have been about a year and a half, almost half. Or, uh, a little over a year after the end of it all, all of the timeline that we discussed. Oh, man. Not it's that gray area. It's very gray. Maybe this right. will help. I got two years. Details. I'm like, ah, mm -hmm. they stopped. Yeah. Weeks after, oh, good chance you got them. Mm -hmm. A year, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe if she waited six more years, he would have gone back to it, right? True. Continue the pattern. Let me, let me know what you think on this one, because and this might help kind of solidify that gray zone. After the murder of Pepitone, Monfrey left New Orleans for Los Angeles. Because remember, this is where the Esther shot him was in Los Angeles, December 1920. And so, Christian, I don't know if we have an exact timeline of when Monfrey moved from New Orleans, outside of just being after, but it's, it's a pretty coincidental window. Within like 15 months, at least, at most, right? Yeah, it's tight enough. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to find that, but he's, he's looking for it. He's typing away. Um, now, while he looks, 10 years prior to the Axeman attacks, Monfrey was the lead suspect in a corner store bombing that took place in New Orleans. So now if, if it was Monfrey, this would be 1908, the bombing of a corner store. 1911, some ax murder sprees that may or may not be involved. And then 1918, right. the, the t stuff we're talking about today. But let's talk about this bombing real quick. He was accused by Carmelo Graffanini, the owner of the corner store. Graffanini lived there with his wife and four children. It is believed that the bombing was an assassination attempt on Graffanini and his family, as Monfrey was the suspected leader of the Black Hand Mafia group. Multiple sources note that Black Hand became more of a practice than an organized group. However, it was an extortion tactic that was commonly used during the time of the Axeman killings. Monfrey was jailed for this time, but was released on parole in June of 1915. That kind of throws out the 1911 stuff being in play, but it does. But um, again, we have an, an, a store owner on the on the corner of Italian descent 
it's again, it's it's flimsy by modern standards, but it's just, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, it doesn't explain the previous spree. It doesn't. But, but I mean, the wrinkle on that one was, did that spree happen in 1911? Remember right, that? Right, that's There's true. There's no coroner reports. But then I start to go, but what if this? But what if that? I know, I lost? know. It just, uh. <laughs> so many different things that tuck nicely into a handful. Yep. Nothing ever tucks nicely completely into all of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting nonetheless. Yeah. So to reiterate, all this evidence, again, by modern standards, is circumstantial as some sources claim that there are no records of a Joseph Monfrey even existing, which just makes these early 1900s, <sighs> even mid-1900s mysteries just frustrating. None of that tangible goodness. Nope. Though he may have gone by a different name. That's the idea here. And the story of Esther Pepitone killing Monfrey is different depending on the source. So some sources say that after she left New Orleans, Pepitone married a man named Angelo Albano, who had business dealings with Monfrey. Albano disappeared, and on December 5th, 1921, Monfrey came to Pepitoni's home to demand money from them. And then if she refused, Monfrey said that he would, quote, kill her the same way he had killed her husband. And thereby you end. Oh, that's a big story. Right. But again, it's like kind of word of mouth. Yeah. Is, that's and how that's, some sources put it. The further back you get, the, the less evidence, um, the lack of records. Yep. And the greater the word of mouth becomes. Another piece of flag before Christian comes, I mean, he's looking at the world's oldest newspaper clipping that might still exist, uh, researching the question from before, but something else to flag that kind of carries the point. We're talking about some sources say this versus other things. This was giving the year of 1921, whereas earlier other sources were giving the year of 1920. It's not a typo. That's how we have it. And so the wrinkle is what's real? Are we in the matrix? Is this, did Joseph even exist? Did anyone move to Los Angeles? I can't figure it out, but I'm starting to lose my mind. We'll never know. We'll never know. And that's we what's unfortunate. We'll never know. And that's why it's a mystery. Uh, sometimes I love talking about mysteries. That's just my thing. But sometimes these things frustrate me to no end. Man, I'm just saying, if either us or the task force ever come across a time down. machine, you just go through the episodes of our catalog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just... It's that way you could just alleviate all the frustrations. Yeah. And you just solve that, you solve that, you solve that. Yep. Uh, I need some cool, cool blue jazz to calm me down after this one. Christian, what do you got? I don't even remember what I asked, if I'm honest. <laughs> I got too frustrated there at the end. You were asking about a uh, timeline on Monfrey moving to LA. Got and it. Whether, like, how that corroborates with the, or uh, lines up with the story. Mm -hmm. Kind of what you're saying this whole account of uh, Esther Pepitone moving to LA along with Monfrey moving to LA, none of that is corroborated. They, people have looked into it. <sighs> There's no evidence that a, an, an Esther Pepitone or an Esther Albano was arrested, tried, or convicted for a murder in California. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence that there was uh, a Joseph Monfrey in, in California. There's no evidence that there was one in New Orleans who had a confirmed criminal background. It's possible from what I'm reading, Monfrey was not um, an uncommon last name. Okay. But based on records available and how old they are, we you, nothing, none of it is able to be confirmed. So yeah. it's essentially become its own kind of urban legend. Oh man, you just widened the gray zone. We live oh, in the gray 100%. zone. Yeah, we do. Oh, man. Also, this is the person that said they saw two people. They saw two. Well, yeah, they saw two people. They didn't remember details. And then suddenly they're like, that's the man. That's the person. Listen, journalists at large, journalize. Don't, don't start fictionalizing things and like, I'm going to sell this newspaper willy nilly. Right. You are impacting the future in weird and odd ways. This butterfly effect of ours is, is happening like, no, 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 this is just to make it like a quirky little article. This this right. will push the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Stop it. This is okay? this is uh, new evidence. Right. Right. And you know <sighs> it's still happening. Everyone does that, though. And that doesn't make it okay. Oh, it Stop doesn't. It. Stop it. And now, well, now all news is owned by like, like three game, people, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like a game of telephone. It is. That really is what's happening. I mean, of course, we can be silly with like journalistic integrity or whatever, but but the idea is like, a lot of things are lost to time. Stories, records, oh, yeah. whatever. And it, and it makes these kind of cases very interesting, very compelling, but also equally frustrating. So at the end of the day, that's why we explore them on the surface level. We're going to dissect and distill down into that little cup of yours, all the knowledge that's out there. 
we do we we cast the wide net and yep. we bring them all to you, Task Force. But uh, we're not going to get in the weeds and start undercovering the, uh, the 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 seedy underbelly of the local mafia. Just I don't, I don't got the stones for it. Uh, <laughs> nah, no, that's okay. I'll be like, no, no, no. I read I read about that on uh, 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 Br- Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> I've seen Godfather. 1998. Okay. It came in five discs. <laughs> 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 All right, that's been the Axeman of New Orleans. Had you heard of that prior no, to this? Most definitely not. Really? No, wow. not at all. Christian, did you know about it? I knew a quick like log line about it. Yeah, I heard that it happened. I didn't know anything else. The log line is yeah, he he goes around, uses an axe, loves jazz. Yeah, the jazz really? was supposed to ward him off. Yeah, and What's... he kind of became like supernatural beyond that point. Like it, it carried kind of, the idea yeah. of like he became like a figure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have not heard of 99% of the things we cover on this show. You guys have heard of a, a lot, I would go That's as far as actually say. That's incredibly accurate percentage. The two what? of you, Atlantis and Titanic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, where did you guys go to school? Who are you hanging out with? Were you hearing all this stuff? I home college on, I- Wik- <laughs> on Wikipedia. Because I get out there, ain't nobody talking about no jazz murderer. Yo, I twisted my algorithm. <laughs> I watched like I listened to some creepy stories one time in college and mm-hmm. I you know and down the mystery yep. mystery Same rabbit hole you go. Yep. I don't know. I, I just uh I think there's something morbidly fascinating. Like, you know, we dabble with true crime, but I really like internet based mysteries and I like, you know, things like that, spooky stories. Well, um, mysteries in general are just like a yeah. big genre. Mm-hmm. People love mysteries. And so I don't know, I just kind of every now and then I always return to it. And then, yeah. So it's yeah. always kind of in my periphery. How about you, Christian? A lot of time on Snopes. Yeah. yeah. A lot of time on Cracked. If you guys ever went on Cracked back in the day, they would do a lot of articles like this. Mm-hmm. Like that's where I first heard about D.B. Cooper. They do like the craziest crimes ever happened. Yada, yada, yada. Mm. And a lot of, a lot of ask Reddit threads and be like, what's the creepiest mystery or most puzzling mystery? Mm-hmm. There's a lot, a lot of reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of reading, a lot of going, ooh, that sounds interesting. And, and then yeah, sometime after 1 a.m. when you're supposed to be asleep, you're like, I can't help but want to read something spooky. And now I have a podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh, that we release, really? I think, at 3 a.m. We do. Yeah. 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I, um, you don't see people telling mysteries in game chat. I'll tell you that no. much. You know what I mean? But listen, no you one's had... telling you mysteries while you're hooping on the court. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Y'all heard right. about D.B. Cooper? Shoot the J. <laughs> you know? Shoot it. So, yeah, well, you knew about things that I didn't know about. Like as a kid, you knew about all the, the details of games and tech, like TV, cutting yeah, edge technology. And yeah, like, it's the stuff that I was Like you were telling into. me about, what was that cable connector oh, that you S had? Video? S video? I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Stop me from playing my games Christmas Day. That was what the S was. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> All right, Task Force, thank you so much for listening. And as always, thank you so much for the continued outpour of love on social media, in the reviews, wherever you listen to the podcast. Those reviews really help us surface and find new Task Force members, new mystery lovers, and, uh, and for sharing the show with your friends and supporting the show with merch, all sorts of stuff. Just this, appreciate it. This show has reached unbelievable uh, yes. heights in, in a short time, and that's because of you guys. I mean, mm-hmm. we have... A sippy cup. Absolutely. We for do. God's sake. A yeah. freaking sippy cup. Right. And for some reason, you guys are thirsty for it. It's I don't like, understand. It's spherical. <laughs> it's <laughs> spherical. It's, it's, it's a so thing. Good. I want to go bowling with that thing. I was, I put a hamster in it. Put a real small hamster. <laughs> <laughs> a mouse with a razor blade axe. All right. Well, Task Force. A little bit of news for you. We don't have a new episode or a new mystery next week. We've built in this year a few off weeks to let the research team recuperate. And so you're going to see, we're going to forecast them so you know what weeks we're taking off. But if you ever see us maybe three or four times throughout the year, not upload an episode, we'll let you know on social. It's because we're taking just a minor break. For example, whether it be holidays or just feeling like Just it. a oh, minor oh. break. What's Don't happened? worry. Oh, we got construction going Can down at the door? Task Force HQ. <laughs> Close the door. We're gonna have to take a little break. Sorry, I opened the door. Were you recording something? <laughs> yeah, why? We're still on the air. Oh, okay. So unfortunately, we're tearing stuff down, but we will return. Okay, bye. Just made that kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>